I became vegan, it was at the end of 1994, um, when, you know, I remember like Rice Dream was the only really like overtly vegan option available. Um, and I, it was a number of factors. I was involved in the, the straight edge hardcore music scene and there was a lot of bands really talking about veganism and pushing that message and so I really, uh, it really just spoke to me and I, I guess I've always kind of really uh, been, I've always hated bullies and I just really saw what was happening to animals as just, you know, the powerful exploiting the weak and that really uh, resonated with me. So I became vegan in 1994 and got involved in the animal rights movement maybe a couple years later. I got involved in ALF actions really just from being frustrated. You know, I was a, I was a, I was a, I was a, a protester. Uh, I was a grassroots activist, and we would just go out. And, and, and this is in Seattle, in the mid '90s, we would go out and wave signs outside the, the the biomedical research building at the University of Washington and in various places. And, um, and and there was a point where I, I realized that I didn't want to switch from becoming an above ground activist to an underground, but I wanted to to supplement or complement my above ground activism with things that were working outside the law, uh, tactics that were outside the law, uh, because I felt like, you know, I wasn't achieving gains fast enough. Now, we would go out and do leafleting and stuff that I feel really good about, like outreach is so important, but there's no reason that can't be supplemented with actions that also bring like short term immediate results. And so um, one of the first things I did is I, uh, there was a horse, or not a horse, a uh, pig slaughterhouse right outside of Seattle in a town called Burlington. And me and my friends went there one night. We didn't really know what we wanted to do. We just really felt like we had to uh, take some action. And we, um, we broke into the slaughterhouse and we took um, the, the, I think it's called the captive bull air gun that, that, that kills the animals. Um, they only had uh, one and, and, we, and we, we used some bolt cutters and, and cut that. Um, from the, the cord it was attached to, and we took a bunch of um, cutlery that was used to kill animals. We took all this stuff out of the building and discarded, um, discarded it elsewhere. And you know, there's really no way to know how that translated to save lives, and maybe it translated, it didn't translate at all. But at least it had a greater chance of saving lives than what we were doing in the daytime, which was waving signs and, and so forth. So that was one of the first things I did. And, and um, I eventually went to achieve uh, results that I felt like were very measurable. And um, that really just uh, gave me the inspiration to continue that kind of action together a book uh, called the ALF Diary of Actions and it was the first 30 years of ALF Actions going back to 1979 in the US and um, when I sat back and compiled this timeline I started to look at you know uh, kind of what are the patterns and maybe what are some of the, the mistakes that ALF has made and what are some of the things they could do better and one of the things I noticed is that there was a very um, sort of scattershot uh, uh, approach to, to ALF actions where you know you'd have people breaking out windows one night and, uh, at a McDonald's and people attacking a first store the next night and I really you know started to think you know what if these 1300 ALF actions had all been focused on one industry you really would have seen the collapse of, of, of several smaller you know vulnerable industries so um, I began to kind of look at it and just think you know what if the ALF has some sort of gr uh, greater uh, uh, strategic um, kind of um, uh, um, basis for what they were doing and um, how powerful the ALF could be. And, you know, you, if you had, if every action that happened in the last three years had been gone after like a, a really vulnerable target that was really like a linchpin in a, in a really small industry, um, I really think the ALF could have achieved much greater victory. So I've been kind of thinking about this and thinking about what the ALF could do. Uh, 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 and as I said in my talk, like how to fight smarter and not just harder. You read uh, literature, um, um, the inside literature, the trade publications for some of these industries, these animal abuse industries, and they talk about in really candid terms just how um, vulnerable some of their industries are. I have a memo from a guy um, who works at a fur breeder, a, a fur feed supplier um, in, in, right outside, uh, outside uh, Seattle. And um, he, he, this memo was, I don't think he ever intended it to be seen by anybody, but he talks about how if the, the cost of fur feed was increased just 10 or 15 percent, the entire mink industry in this country would collapse. And that's how, like, the razor-thin margins we're talking about. I saw something else recently, uh, another fur trade publication, and they were talking about how this one fur uh, pelt processor uh, just south of Madison, Wisconsin, it's called North American Fur Auctions, and they also process pelts, that, meaning they like, treat them and skin them and stuff. Um, if that, that one particular business is absolutely crucial to the survival of the entire mink industry in the U.S. And now, if that business didn't exist, there's literally nothing that could replace it. And it's really fascinating to look at how weak some of these industries are. And if you really just had a really focused campaign against, uh, ALF campaign against, you know, sometimes just something as simple as one or two small buildings, um, and, you know, and you have a, a processing time in the fur industry of only a few months. So let's say a building was decommissioned for a few months. You literally would, would, would destroy the entire year's uh, crop, so to speak, um, uh, of mink in the country. It's, it's just fascinating to look at. Uh, I would say the fur industry, uh, again, is really vulnerable. Um, really any small sort of niche industry, I think, is really vulnerable. Foie gras is extremely small. 
Um, um, I mean, you saw, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, there were at one time, about 15 years ago, there were only uh, four uh, slaughterhouses in the country that killed horses exclusively. So that horse slaughtering industry was very small, and you had one man uh, named Jonathan Paul with some other people who went and burned down a horse slaughterhouse. That horse slaughterhouse had to permanently close as a result. And for other reasons, the other three in the next few years all shut down. And so effectively, you have no horse slaughtering industry in this country right now, um, in part because of, of ALF activity. So um, um, that's an example of what I'm talking about. And how, how did you get involved? That, in that, that thought was kind of sparked. I talked to a woman one day, and she was saying, you know, how shocked she was that there was an egg farm that was like, I don't know, it was like four or five hours from her house. And she had never even, she just like blew her mind. And I was just thinking, you know, if you don't realize that within 20 minutes of your house, I don't care where you live in the country, if you think within 20 minutes, if not five, there is not a factory farm, slaughterhouse, uh, a laboratory or fur farm, or all four, you are extremely misinformed. I mean, this stuff is so pervasive in this society. At the same time, it's so invisible. I mean, it's everywhere, but, but it's nowhere at the same time. Um, and it's shocking to me it's just how little people know about what's going on in their neighborhoods. It's really interesting when I look at myself, and, 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 and this falls into the subject of sort of leveraging your strengths and figuring out, not necessarily working you know, a lifetime to correct your weaknesses, but just figuring out who you essentially really are and what your strengths are, your inherent strengths, and, and using those um, for animals. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I was the kid that, frankly, I was, like, really into, like, being an amateur spy, and I would, like, spy on my sister and her friends when they were, like, playing in the backyard, and, like, you know, I was, and I was kind of always the kid that was sort of sneaking around. I really felt like that, I was able to parlay that into my activist career really easily, into, into I think some things I think that were really uh, effective. So, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, knowing who you are and what your skills are and leveraging that for animals is really, really important. One of the biggest changes I've seen in the last 15 years has been um, the, the above ground national groups. Um, I feel like they've actually gotten a lot uh, smarter and more effective at what they're doing. I really like, and it's, we've got a long way to go, but I like how the bigger groups are having to acknowledge veganism as an issue, um, uh, and they're not shying away from it anymore. And I think that's really, really important. And I, it, you know, they're not there yet, but, um, but, but there's a lot of progress being made. Um, so, and I, I, what I see now, like with groups like Mercy for Animals doing the undercover footage, is just awesome. I mean, that is like, like when it comes to like the best sort of a, uh, like lo, uh, low uh, sort of effort, like high yield thing you can do in terms of the things that are legal. That those that undercover footage is amazing. Um, I really like uh, what they're doing, and uh, and so I see the bigger groups actually getting getting a little bit smarter about what they're doing. Um, um, Grassroots activists um, um, also in some ways getting smarter, but I feel like it's still too scattered. We don't really, at this point in the movement, we do not have like a real focus uh, in, like, on the grassroots level, which is unfortunate. Uh, in terms of direct action and, and the ALF, um, the actions are getting uh, fewer and further between. Um, despite all the FBI hype, there's actually fewer and fewer things happening, but um, those things are, tend to be of higher impact when they do happen. Um, still not much of a focus, um, and that's one of the things I was trying to talk about during my talk the other day, is like a focus would go a long way, uh, because you could achieve some huge victories um, if you could sort of, uh, I, again, the cells don't coordinate, so it's very difficult, but if there's some sort of like collective understanding that this is what we're going after right now, um, I, I just, the power of the ALF is so huge, and it has not been maximized. I have a little publishing imprint called Warcry Communications, and I put out five books now. Um, and it's primarily focused on ALF-related um, um, subjects, but I also have another book that's just um, raw data of addresses of laboratories and fur farms and so forth. Um, so I have a book by Keith Mann, who's a former ALF prisoner, named from, called From Dust Till Dawn. I just uh, put out a collection of old ALF newsletters going from the 1990s called Underground. Um, I have a, a book uh, by Rod Coronado, a collection of his writings called Flaming Arrows. You can get all that on voiceofthevoiceless.org or, or Amazon uh, for that matter. Uh, so yeah, it's something I've been doing now just to kind of like capture the history of the ALF.